excited for this uh, next presentation? Yes. So um, I, have a, I have a confession. Are you ready? Ready. Yeah. So John has been my design crush since I started like 16 years ago. And I uh, had the opportunity of meeting him in WordPress Orlando for one of our meetups and uh, changed my life. So I definitely know that if you're here, you're in for a treat. And then does anyone know what's happening afterwards? Yes, AMA. So buckle in. I see you have your notebooks, your favorite beverages. John, are you ready? All set. All right, enjoy guys. Thank you. All right, thank you David. Okay, let's see here. It's a Saturday morning. When I was younger, there was this thing called Saturday morning cartoons. So you're missing out. Secondly, if you're way far behind there, don't worry about getting up and coming here because in a normal situation, these are the most expensive seats. If you were in, like, who's ever gone to a New York show before? New York show, right? How much do those seats cost in the front? Right? A few thousand in some cases? Free. <laughs> All free here. Uh, second thing to note is that, in general, um, a speaker will perform better if there are more people in the front. So if you're ever trying to get more value out of the talk, sit in the front, because it'll increase the pressure on them. Oh, yeah, come on. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, I really mean it. It's like a really great place to sit over here. There's four over here. Uh, it isn't like the aisle seat problem in an airplane. Yeah, go on, it's okay. Um, uh, because people are nice here, you can use the bathroom, it's all right. Yeah, come on, come on back, come on, that's good, it's good. And uh, by the way, this, there's a big gigantic M AMA afterwards, which means you'd be stuck here, which would be terrible. So because you're in this place called Miami, which I've heard in the music industry is like awesome. So I don't want you to be stuck in here. So I believe we'll do some stuff. We'll take a break. We'll do more stuff, but we're not going to take this whole time because the real value, thank you. Uh, right here is fine, too, if you'd like. Right here, this is like $10,000, $10,000. Right there, thank you. Go ahead, it's okay. Thank you. Right there, $10,000 seats. Oh, first class, mo first class, everyone. First class moment. Thank you. Yeah, okay, excellent, okay. Uh, but it really is something for you, for all of you who speak or are going to have to speak at some time, make sure you ask people to sit in front because it's just so much easier. Who knows why, is it, why it's easier? Raise your hand. I can hear you, but I can also see you. So like, um, and luckily I can see, because some people cannot see, but I, I can see that like, oh, so what I'm saying is communicating. Right? If I talk like this, like, oh, hi, how's everybody? It's so awesome. I know you love what I'm saying. Uh, cannot, you can't see. And I didn't realize it, because I had this uh, mentor of mine, Richard Saul Werman, who was the founder of the TED conferences. He's not famous because he sold the conference, um, but, uh, but uh, he, didn't, he didn't make a lot of money off of it, but he sold it. But he, he was known for being kind of obnoxious, like very obnoxious. So, and there's a code of conduct, so I can't repeat things he said or did. But um, one thing I remembered is how every time I invited him to speak somewhere, he would make everyone stand up, I mean, awkward, and come up all in front. And I won't do that to you, but I will ask you to come in front because I think it's valuable. Um, and I didn't really get it until one time I was invited to talk at a friend's thing, and it was in this L.A. theater. Who's from Los Angeles? Los Angeles? Los Angeles. It's like very dense in some places in downtown. So it was like a movie theater, but it was one of those movie theaters L.A. style, you know, like off the main. So it was like this super narrow box. It was, it was like maybe like, like five, five seats all the way back. And everyone was seated like all the way back. And it was dark. And I was talking to the audience like this. And I was like, whoa, this is awkward. I have no idea if anything I'm saying is communicating. So from that moment, I realized how important it is to have that feedback loop. 
feedback loop is the basis of any good experience design. It's because you're actually curious what the other person is experiencing. Now, this may be obvious to many of you who make things, but it's not obvious to a lot of people who make things in technology. It's because when you make things in technology, you assume the position. You know the position? But you hunch down, and you get the keyboard ready, and you have like coffee like you know, three fingers away, and you've got your screen, and you're a Neo in the Matrix, and you're like, I've got the entire world at my fingertips. And then you ship it, like I shipped it. And then you watch Google Analytics and like, oh wow, three people clicked this and I totally understand what they're thinking. <laughs> and I'm gonna optimize and I totally get, oh, that person in Alaska, I get it, you know? And so it's kind of a, it's a mode of indirect connection to people. And this is in every technology company today. And why does it pervade? It pervades because this model is successful. It's a model that produces value. It produces shareholder value. It produces extreme wealth. So who are you to say that it should be done any differently because the numbers are going up? Why should I get out of my chair and go and talk to someone or or see someone because I have the numbers. The numbers, are, the numbers show this is improving. And so this is a kind of a, I'll use this sort of a moment as a kind of metaphor for why making technical products requires people in that loop. And I, and I refuse to call people users because that's a drug industry uh, <laughs> phrase. Right, like, well, let's talk about our users, and like, what's a user? And so um, I like to say guests or customers in the case that they're paying. And in some cases, people will push back at me say, and saying, well, they're not, they didn't pay anything. But in reality, everyone is paying with their time. Now, I don't know how, no, how many of you um, uh, pay in time to social media, but I pay a lot of money uh, in time to social media, and so I am a customer, and I do expect a high quality experience in my time. So, uh, I don't say user, I like to say guest, or customer, or answer any, any other word than user, because user, the, the idea of user and the drug industry goes to the very heart and core of all technology-based experiences, which are based on the science of addiction. Um, there's a great book on addiction uh, that goes not to the technology industry, but to one of our most famous uh, institutions, gambling. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Design by Addiction. It isn't a design book. It's a social scientist's uh, experience living for three years in Las Vegas to understand how does addiction occur. Uh, and her observations around how the simple idea of the near miss, the near miss, I could have got it, I could have won, is wired in our brain in such a way that once you catch on that, you're hooked. And a lot of the te technology companies love this idea of what's called the super perfect engagement loop and getting hooked. And so we have to ask this the question, uh, I'm not asking anyone to feel guilty about this, I'm asking us to sort of think about it because it's an important question for designing anything today. Now, uh, I just released something called Design and Tech Report, and I'm, I'm, I'm not used to projecting things in four by three. So I'm trying to understand, I've just changed my computer to 1024 by 768, which I haven't done for a long time. But it appears the proportions are slightly strange, but we'll figure this out, okay. So, uh, and this report is live on the network. This is a local running copy, and it's a bridge version. And you can visit it any time. You just uh, search for design in tech report. Uh, I released this last week at South by Southwest. It is not accessible. It is not mobile. It has a variety of flaws in it. 
uh, I had to release it, and I did it in a new way. I did it all using uh, CSS and J JavaScript and all kind of things I always wanted to like figure out again. So uh, that's why it's a bit dangerous. Um, but uh, don't worry, I won't destroy your computer, but it is not finished. Okay, so this word design, how many of you are designers in this room to design things? Okay, yeah. So um, since I began the design and tech report, I like to frame three kinds of designs. Because the word design is a terribly designed word. It means all kind of things. Like, I love the design of your hair. I love the design of your shirt. I love the design of your glasses, you know? Um, it can mean so many types of things. And so I like to frame one kind of design that we all know really well, which is classical design. Classical design is a kind of design that is taught in art and design departments, art and design schools. Who is a classical designer? Classical designer. Okay, so you were trained to be a classical designer. Um, who else is trained to be a classical designer? Over here, right. So classical designer. So a classical designer has to make it the right way. There's a right way. Did you look at this and this and this? And, well, I think it's too small or it's too big. Or it's, there's a, it's this kind of machine intelligence, kind of like a guild that says what is good and what is bad. And it's always moving. It's with the zeitgeist. It's the culture. It's changing. Um, but it's subjective. It's, it's highly subjective. Um, and because it's subjective, it's interesting. Because it involves how people experience things. Because who thinks people are easy to get along with? <laughs> Look, OK, unanimous. Uh, it's like, oh, I, I can get along with anybody. You know, like, no, I don't think so. Uh, because people react to things. And depending upon what they ate, you know, I just discovered this thing called avocado toast. <laughs> I had no idea that the high fat content could make me less grumpy by 11 a.m. I had no idea. Those of you who don't know about this, you have to get in on this. Uh, I've been eating regular toast for so long, I get grumpy at 11 a.m. So check it out. Um, but anyways, how we react is always different. So, um, and when I, when I joined Automatic, which is a company that is founded by one of the co-founders of the WordPress open source project, uh, Matt Mullenweg, um, Matt asked me to bring design into the WordPress ecosystem in Automatic and just in general see what's possible. And so I've been spending like a year, over a year now, uh, basically studying every little bit of WordPress, uh, learning as much as I can about WordPress, but most importantly about the people. Um, and I've been narrowly um, focusing, uh, targeting how to make WordPress more relevant to more people. Uh, because uh, if you haven't noticed, there's this thing called social media. I, I mentioned it. You know, there was a day when nobody could put anything on the internet. Who remembers those times? Remember FTP? Yeah, it's like, oh yeah. It's like, only I can put stuff on the internet. Because I can, like, type the commands. And I know what Apache is. It's not, you know, it's bad. All, it's, all these names, actually, you have, to, you have to question every technology word, by the way. But anyways, it was a way to distribute information that I could because I was a privileged technology person. You know? Not, not, not I'm a bad person. I just ended up in a situation where I was front first in line, and I could do this, and it was amazing. And WordPress was one of the first systems that allowed generally more people to be able to publish on the internet. Again, for those who are younger, there was a time when there was no Facebook. <laughs> I know. It's hard to imagine. There was no way to tell anybody what you, what you were doing. It was like, I'm just doing stuff. And <laughs> wake up in the morning and drink your coffee. And it's like, yeah, what should I do today? I don't know. What's someone still thinking? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to pick up a magazine. Oh my gosh, that's what Rihanna from 20 years ago was doing. That's amazing, you know? Star, you know? Now you're like, now, now see, so that didn't exist. So 
putting stuff on the internet was hard. And WordPress solved it for a lot of people and a lot more people. But, and also it was before the smartphone era. So I think that for those of you who are in the WordPress ecosystem looking back to the year 2007, who was here in the WordPress ecosystem 2007? I mean, it was a great time. It was a time where like there was very little competition, it was the rising platform, and nothing could stop it because there wasn't all this other stuff out there happening. There was stuff happening, Facebook, et cetera. But then this thing came out, this thing here, I'm not sure if you know what this is. Uh, this thing came out, and this thing changed everything because it meant that everyone could use the internet. Yeah, everyone could, not just people who had a computer. You have to remember that 20 years ago, people who had computers were ostracized. It was embarrassing. You'd cover it up when they were partying. <laughs> you have a computer? Nerd. <laughs> right? Now, like, everyone has one of these. It's like, everyone's a nerd. You know, it's like interesting. But like, back then, like, oh, I see. You're a computer aficionado, questionable, you know? We'll, like, mark this person off our friend list. Um, that was the way things were. So now everyone has a computer. And because everyone has a computer, uh, it means that everyone has different tastes. Everyone is bringing different tastes and sensibilities. And so if you think about it, the way things were, you know, a desktop computer on a 17-inch screen, 10, 24, 7, 68, you know, maybe you have an XGA, it's like amazing, you know, better keyboard, whatever, it's like this world here is no longer as valid as the regular world of, quote unquote, more people that are less tech savvy. And so I think that change has happened. And my interest is how to really open up the wonderful thing I've gotten to see in the WordPress world, which is all of you. Because all of you are here on a Saturday. And everyone who's doing this is a volunteer. This is interesting. It's interesting because it means that it's, it's kind of a movement against something. And the against something is rising. The against something is a world where you really can't trust everything that's out there. You need something to believe in. So some of you have known this for a while. It's been articulated differently. Some of you are newer to it. And you're kind of like, huh, what is this? You know, I'll check this, check this ride in the carnival of life out. Like, what is it? And so, in order to activate that, I'm very interested in design of all types. So, for instance, just, uh, this was yesterday, maybe. What is March 15th? Could be like the day before. March 15th, whenever that was, two days ago, I think, uh, I just got back to Final Hats. So, I've been, I've been messing around in uh, WordPress uh, merchandise world. You may have seen some of the stuff we put out last year, WordPress University. The reason why we put that out is because I noticed that so many people learn how to code in WordPress. And maybe some of them don't have a college degree in computer science. But in many senses, they believe this is their university. So it's kind of an alumni shirt. Mm. Also released different sort of um, modernist interpretations of WordPress.org. You may see a black Helvetica. It has a horizontal and a vertical. You may have also seen the Gutenberg shirt. It's kind of like this like, colorful, it's a very sort of like a colorful pattern of hand-drawn strokes. And I've seen some of you have it. Uh, on the back, there's a little smile. And the smile is a WAPU. Those of you who are new to WAPU. WAPU is uh, like the Pikachu of WordPress. Um, and so, you know, made like a Cheshire cat version of, of WAPU. It's like, what is that? What is that smiling at me? Well, that's WAPU. Um, and also, Many of you who have lived with WAPU for so long don't know it looks kind of weird. It's like, what is that? It's a little bit shocking, you know? But after a while, like, oh, I kind of love this. This is good, you know? And so uh, I began uh, taking a, a page from the playbook of the Nantucket Black Dog brand, where it's like a silhouette. Like, what is it? And so uh, I've been looking to, for the right silhouette. And so just recently came out with this silhouette here. Um, it's a WAPU silhouette, which the average person looks at like, what is that? What is that? 
So because of that, they're going to ask you, what is it? And you can tell them what it is. That's the idea. However, whenever you, whenever you put something out, people hate it. Um, so I put this out there, and you know, it's my hat. I like my hat. Um, and, uh, and this is the new Wapu shirt. You see that with the uh, Cheshire Wapu? See that? Um, anyways, um, so this is an example of please stop making stuff with this thing. It's just lazy. I wish you'd design it. You know, or like, uh, I don't really believe in embroidery. So technologists will say that. I think I like this other technology better. Or like, I agree, this, we're not, this isn't Mickey Mouse. Um, another one, looks horrendous. Who posts things on social media and gets responses like this? Raise your hand. It's always interesting, you know? And you listen, I, I, don't, I don't mute people. I, I, I mute the terrible, terrible people, because they do exist. The people who have like an opinion, I'm like, oh, okay, I totally get that. So I respond on internet too. So this is my response. Hi, I designed them. Uh, it wasn't as easy as you think. It's pretty hard to get a, and also you can't see, but it's a it's metallic uh, thread. So it's silver, gold, white, black. It just shines in the light. So it's, it's a little subtle thing. Getting the right hat, the right, you know, like, I don't like these kind of hats. I don't wear these kind of hats. So I want to be, like, you know, loose enough for my head because my head's kind of, like, uh, amorphous. Um, uh, it's great to know people who love them and also know people who dislike them because whenever you make something for the consumer world, you're going to have both. So I'm really happy that some people actually love it and some people don't like it, and that's totally okay. Um, it's because I believe in this idea that WordPress is good design for all. And if WordPress is good design for all, it has to cover a wide territory. And so you'll see different experiments like this. Some of you, you're not going to like. And if you don't like it, just tell me, because I'm really curious why I don't like it. I'll also notice that people do like it. And I'm like, why do you like it? You know, a simple example of a weird test is, uh, anything I designed in the past, my daughters hate. I'm just not going to take it. I designed these hats, and they're all gone now. I was like, why'd you take that? These are, these are not teenagers. These are like adult people type people. I said, oh, it's just interesting. So just one signal. Um, and so I, I urge you to, to look at these things as they come out. Uh, they're they're um, low-risk items. And I'm using it to sort of get data to hear what fits and doesn't fit. Now. I knew this man. His name is Bill Mogridge. He was the co-founder of a company called IDEO. And IDEO, five minutes left. IDEO is a design firm that really kind of catalyzed this idea of design thinking. Who's here of design thinking? Design thinking? Design thinking. Design thinking was on the cover of Harvard Business Review last year, which means jump the shark. Which means like everyone's like, oh, okay, design thinking. It was Bill was a visionary, and he passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was also the, the director of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and Bill had a saying about design that it's very simple. There's an easy design principle that binds everything together. It's about starting with the people. So when you think about design challenges for WordPress. I see it all as a people challenge, uh, people in this room, people outside this room. How do we think about design differently? Okay, my gosh. So yesterday I, was, uh, I just arrived, and I, I like Uber and Lyft, by the way, uh, on Austin Ride, too. Um, but uh, I was picked up by this person, Muriel. Muriel picked me up. I was like, oh, Muriel, okay, cool. So uh, car rides up, it's Muriel. Muriel's having a bad day. <laughs> Muriel's having a bad day. So I get in the car, and Muriel's saying, like, I just got a ticket three hours ago. That's why I called you ahead of time. I was like, okay, not happy. Uh, and, and I heard this whole story about how bad it's been all day long because of this complexity and this licensing and it's $12 here and whatever. And so I kind of felt it's like using WordPress sometimes. 
where you get in the car and say, oh, posts and pages are different. Or like, oh, no, actually, you do it this way instead. And that's actually a plug-in thing or it's a theme thing, you know? But, and so what I, what I realized is like this thing of friction isn't good for the maker and isn't good for the customer either. Um, and I found it so, the reason why I brought this up is because right now uh, at Automatic, uh, the design team is working on a design language called Muriel. Wasn't <laughs> that? I thought I was like, oh, weird moment. Um, called Muriel, which is uh, primarily a language for communicating about design uh, within Automatic and also open sourcing to the WordPress ecosystem to use to help get past this difficult thing that I've noticed uh, exists in a lot of technology companies and in technology ecosystems. is that design is believed to be the shiny part of the thing. You know, it's like, just finish this thing, banged out this code, MVP works, now it's time for design to polish it up. This is common, and it's very common in the WordPress ecosystem. Because of it, it's preventing the ability to build experiences that feel great. Why? It's because the, the, the car is built, the machine is built, and the knobs are shiny. And that is not good design. Uh, that's designed the old way. That's designed from my hat world. That's when design was much more objective, much, much more subjective, much more super, super, superfluous. So design actually is very simple. Uh, design involves understanding the entire experience. And the fact that WordPress is so distributed, you can be like in Bogota, you can be in Paris. There's also a language barrier across, automatic, uh, across WordPress world. And so what I'm trying to produce with the team is a common language, a common standard, a common sort of way that design is talked about, used in WordPress. This will take maybe three years, if it's successful, to really permeate. But Mural is what's going to be driving, I hope, uh, an improvement in design um, in this world that I know a lot of you care about because you came here on a Saturday and everything. Yeah. Oh, time is up. So uh, I didn't even get to my presentation. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I have something that I developed, which is a way to talk to introverts. So um, I have uh, uh, that. This is my phone. So. If you can just text me, I can get your question because, as you know, the problem with the Q&A is there are a few people with a good blah, 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 and it can go long. So I like to optimize uh, Q&A sessions. So this is my number, so just text me questions, and then I will field them as we're, go as we're going along, and I will stop because there are a few things I want to show you about design, but I want to get to your questions. Why do I want your questions? It's because it's a way to uh, create value, to understand you. Because I don't really understand what you came here for. And so by fielding your questions, I can know what to do. OK, so I'll wait here. OK, thank you. And I will call out your area code. I won't read your phone number, so it's, it's totally privacy compliant. Um, OK, so three kinds of design, GIF, or, oh, someone's asking that classical nerd question. GIF or GIF? I say G-I-F. OK. Uh, <laughs> classical design, design thinking, computational design. So classical design is the old way of designing. It's about taste making. It's about rich people, basically. Um, design thinking is about culture building, building consensus, innovating, getting out of the box. Why does a box exist? It's because the box is controlled by people. Oftentimes, the most important person controls that box and doesn't let you in. Who knows what I'm talking about there? Thank you. Right, they're like, yeah, you want to get us out of the box. No, this is my box. 
And, and what happens is innovation doesn't occur. So design thinking is a process to say, OK, boss, let's involve everyone. And let's think laterally. And the boss might say, oh, wait a second. I think this is a good way to think. And then suddenly this idea over here that was developed together, the boss says, I think that's my idea. I think I'll let this, let this happen. And then this idea bubbles to the top. And so design thinking is a way to break out of this kind of uh, uh, centralized thinking, leveraging people. Um, computational design is a kind of design that Mary was talking about, design involving code. Mary, who is here just before me, design involving code, involving any kind of digital computational thinking, involving analytics. Um, this is where the majority of value has been produced in the last uh, decade, computational design. This is a lot of value being produced uh, by uh, strategy companies. And this is designed by the classical industry, just making people who make things. Ooh, what questions here? Any gifts? I see some more gifts. OK, all right, keep coming. OK, um, what's a computational designer? They don't have to code, but they have to understand the idea of code. The idea of code being a way to represent information that isn't the way we, re we, we represent it normally in the language of the computer. Um, they think critically about technology. They're curious about the implications of it. Um, you know, I noticed that there's this, uh, there's a new sort of hashtag trend of hashtag Manhattan Project. It's like, yeah, this is like the Manhattan Project of whatever, it's awesome. You know, you know this, is, this is just like the Manhattan Project, you know? It's kind of like this is the Uber for whatever or the Airbnb forever, for, for whatever. The, the problem, though, with the Manhattan Project is it produced the nuclear bomb that killed like lots of people. Do you see that? It's, again, I'm not putting down science, because I was uh, from the science world, but it's a question of like what you make affects people. So I think that everyone in this room cares about the WordPress ecosystem, so they're thinking critically about why they chose to come here on a weekend. They want to be a part of something that stands for something as a technical person. Uh, a computational designer uses all three kinds of design. So that means that they use classical design, and they use design thinking. They think organizationally. They think classically about taste issues. And they think about uh, computation. Oh, thank you, area code 239 and 561. I'll get to you. Thank you. And lastly, a computational designer loves new things. And if you're a computational designer right now, you are actively learning artificial intelligence. So who here in this room is a computational designer by this definition? Raise your hand. Very good. OK. And for those who aren't, I invite you to do so. Uh, the, the, one of the big barriers is the artificial intelligence one, which I'll show you how easy it is to become artificially intelligent compliant. Does that OK? Good? All right. But first. Ask your questions here. Very good. OK. Area code, whoa. OK, thank you. Here we go. Here we go. Area code 561 asks, what is the first thing to consider and think about when it comes to food design for a new website on WordPress? Correction, good design. Thank you, area code 561. I was thinking about the food design thing. I was like, that's a new kind of question, but I could go there. Um, what's the first thing to consider? Uh, in designing uh, any website today is performance. If you do not think about performance, you are designing a poor website, number one. If you do not think about how it behaves on mobile, it is a bad website, which is a surprise to many people who design websites. Like, uh, I want it to have a beautiful hero image, and I want it to like, go on a 4K screen. And No. Uh, because all statistics show, and I, have a, I think I have a page on that, and it's in the report if you don't see it in this uh, presentation, but the average person will leave your site if it hasn't appeared in three seconds. So that's why performance matters a lot, which is a hard piece of medicine for people who love to design websites the old way to swallow, but once you look at the data, it's like, oh, okay, well, this is a constraint. How do I design for this constraint? How fun, dot, 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 is the thing. Thank you, Eric, code 561. 
Uh, error code 239, is WordPress slash automatic focusing on any zero interface tools? Um, well, first of all, the WordPress ecosystem is vast, so you can like Google anything, like WordPress Cuisinart. I don't know what's gonna show up, but food design will show up for sure. But like anything, like, it's like WordPress is like this cheese or a cracker, or it, just, it goes with everything. So um, definitely there's anything out there, also on speech interfaces too. Uh, is automatic doing anything of that? Nope. Uh, but I'm curious about it, and you'll see, well, you'll see some of the information I've gathered in the report that points to how easy it is to go zero interface if you want to. Anyone can do zero interface. Zero interface meaning uh, no keyboard, no nothing, just a function. Okay. Error code 561. As a developer, how would you recommend improving design skills? Very simple. There is a book out from Ellen Lupton. Uh, it is, I'm also, uh, what is it? we have a saying at Automatic, we are frugal because we're not Google. Uh, <laughs> it's very cheap. It's a $12 book, paperback book, uh, Ellen Lupton. It's called Design is Storytelling. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, for those of you who remember programming in C, in the early era of the 1980s, there was a book called The Kerning and Ritchie Version of C. It was only this thick. It was like that thick. There was a book to learn a language like that thick before. It was awesome. The year and a half later, it was like this thick. You know? <laughs> but uh, Ellen's book is uh, very thin, paperback, and the nice thing is that all profits go to uh, a, a nonprofit. So it's a great uh, little investment to make. Uh, what does this book teach you? It teaches you that design isn't about just how it looks, it's what it does for someone. It's very accessible, and I recommend it everywhere I go. Okay, Erico 305. ADA has a lot of interpretations. Which is best to protect my company design? Great question, Erico 305. You know, depending upon what you read today, and I'm not a lawyer, but I, I almost became a lawyer by accident. But anyways, um, ADA, uh, websites have to be ADA compliant if you are a government uh, contractor, which is really interesting and actually really great because this kind of, le of legislation will change how websites are made. What does that mean? It means that your site has to be accessible to people who, who don't have all the same abilities as the majority of people in this room. So I would say it's gonna change a lot, but people can't see it very well. Uh, that's why a lot of my work um, advocating for uh, interesting design problems is about designing for older people. Uh, because older people are the largest growing segment of consumers next to millennials. Um, and because of medical science, they're not dying as much. So uh, a huge market to tap into. Uh, those of you who are, so th th how many of you in a restaurant, a dark lit restaurant, use this as a flashlight? Raise your hand. Come on. Okay, look at that. Okay. All of you looking at us is going to be you next. <laughs> because it's just, the first thing to go is your eyes. And so then you start asking questions around design, and like, you know, I love my 6.5 point type. Oh, looks so good on that super white space. I think I'll make it light. No, I'll make it ultra light. Ah, oh, it's so good. So by the time you're my age, you're like, what uh, is that? Is there something there? Turn a flashlight, take a camera off, magnify, zoom. Oh, there's type there. Um, so a quick accessibility thing is that. Yes, oh, time to stop. Okay, our time is ended, folks. Sorry for going over time, but I appreciate your attention, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.